uh, Vulcan and George uh, Telepolis I am the independent chair of every Australian count. I am coming to you from the Lansbury land and I'd like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Also I'd like to recognise any Aboriginal people who are joining us today. Um, we have two Australian interpreters and a caption at present. If you would like um, captions, there's a link um, in the uh, chat. So you can access those captions in the link in the chat. Um, and um, I also want to just make sure um, everyone uh, knows that this session is being recorded. Um, if you prefer not to be recorded, um, keep that in mind if you end up speaking, um, uh, well, <laughs> if you end up speaking, you'll be recorded. If you turn on the video, you'll also be recorded. Um, due to the volume of people that we have in today, only those speaking will have their video on. Oh, who wrote that? No, how many people? I want to see those faces. Um, can we, Nick, can we see people's faces? Can we can, that? so we can see people's faces. So if you don't want your image to appear in the recording, please just turn your cameras off, people. Yeah, but I'd like to see the faces because, you know, that makes me feel like I'm kind of, you know, an event where there are people here. <laughs> um, feel free to say, Use the chat box and um, for your comments and for your questions. Obviously, you know, be kind and respectful in doing that. Um, and we'll also take questions later um, after our presentations. And I want to um, just uh, thank everyone for uh, coming today. We've had um, over a thousand registrations. Wow. Um, thank you to everyone for completing the survey. Um, we're using that to guide our discussions today. I also want to acknowledge that I know that we're all feeling quite, um, well, stressed on the way in about all the changes that are coming. And um, that doesn't take care of the field confused and frustrated, um, and this reads out for support, and um, if you do need that support. But remember, we've all got one another, so, and we're all in the same boat, so I think that helps. So, um... Is that right, Dan? What I've done? Without any... Yeah, I should ask the girls. Um, just put yourself on mute if, um, you just entered the room, thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to our fantastic guest, Mitchell Skipsy and Chital Dalakrishnan from the Justice Equity Centre, who have been so, so kind to uh, come along and tell us a bit about their understanding of the recent changes to the NDS legislation. So, um, hand over to you. Um, Mitchell and Chital. Thanks, George. Hi, everyone, and thanks to um, EAC for having us here today. Mm -hmm. uh, we also just want to acknowledge um, the country that we're joining from today, which is the Gadigal country of the Eora Nation, um, and pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to um, First Nations people that are joining today. Um, there's quite a lot that Mitch and I are planning to cover. So um, this, this, yeah, we're also hoping to have time for some questions at the end. Um, but I'll just begin firstly with saying that the this is all, I guess, come out of the NDIS review, which was looking at how to improve various issues with the scheme. Um, and the NDIS review, as we'll all know, made a number of recommendations. Um, the government is yet to 
to respond to the NDIS review report in full and has said that it will do that later this year. Um, in the meantime, the government... Now, can yeah. I just say something? You said this is all for the NDIS review. I don't think that's true. A lot of things that are in the legislation wasn't mentioned in the review, so um, I just think that we need to be really honest about the fact that this legislation has come from a range of different places. One of them is a review, one of them is Pauline Hansen, who has some ideas about things, um, different suspenses, um, people on that, and um, I, I just, I hope that, is that correct, what I'm saying? Yeah, but, thanks. Thanks, George. I, I do agree with that. I guess, um, sorry, I guess I meant it uh, being, I guess, triggered by the NDIS review. And you're right, there are changes that have come from different um, places and people and politicians. And um, so before this this bill um, is, I guess, the government's uh, sort of first response to the um, to some of the recommendations in the NDIS review. Um, and uh, we just also want to say that the disability community did a lot of advocacy um, to try and improve the bill um, and didn't get everything that was, we didn't get, like the disability sector didn't get everything that was being asked for, but just want to note that there were improvements made to the bill compared to the original form in which it was released back in March. Yeah, so... Um... Sheetal and I and others of our colleagues at the, uh, the Justice and Equity Centre, we've been part of some of that, um, I guess, conversation publicly. You might have seen our explainers about the legislation at various stages. Um, but I want to be really, really clear as well up front, uh, the perspective that, that we're coming from today. Sheetal and I are both lawyers. Um, we are senior solicitors at the Justice and Equity Centre. We've been working in this policy area, um, working with um, disability organisations, um, the disability community to try and ensure a, a, a fair NDIS that um, sort of preserves the, the original intentions of the scheme and, and, and rights of people with disability. But we're really, we're, we're very aware that we are not a, uh, a lived experience organisation. We're not a disability representative organisation. We don't um, suggest in any way that what we're doing today is speaking for people with disability. Um, instead, what we're doing is speaking as lawyers with a kind of technical and policy expertise and that's what we're hoping to try and bring to this conversation, to, to equip those of you on the call who are part of that community to engage with the, the, the new world of, of policy that we live in now and the, the future steps that are going to come. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is going to be around the legislation that's passed and what that means and, and some of the processes around that. I want to acknowledge up front there are going to be some things that we won't be touching on that I know people have got questions about, um, and that's because things that are outside of that legislation, things that are part of the broader policy environment, I'll particularly name check uh, things like foundational supports or things like provider registration, those are not part of the bill that has just passed, and those are not things that we really feel like we're well equipped to speak to as lawyers in this conversation. So... There are going to be some things, I think, that you may go away from today thinking, oh, I still don't know about that. That's because, again, we're talking about the bill that's passed Parliament um, and, and will be coming into effect on the 3rd of October. Um, also want to thank again everyone who submitted questions along with the registration to let us know what you're interested in and the topics that you're considering. We've had a look through those. We're trying to, to address the vast majority of those, I think, as we go through the, the subject matter today in the webinar. Um, I do want to flag a lot of the questions that we've seen people have are really uh, personal ones that relate to their specific circumstances and, and the particular kinds of supports that they want to seek. And I can totally understand why that is. Those are questions on people's minds. We're not here today to provide really specific individual legal advice. That's just not possible to do in this kind of a format. And so there may well be, again, specific questions that relate to really individualised things that we're just not able to cover. Um, but hopefully we can at least provide a frame for thinking about those things and I know that there'll be resources for where you can get uh, further advice and support with those sorts of particular issues going forward. Um, so having set some of those parameters up, um, I think we'd probably better get into the, uh, the, the, the big subject matter we've got to cover today um, and I might throw to, to Sheetal to kick us off with that. <laughs> 
Thanks, Mitch. Um, yeah, so Mitch and I are just going to go back and forward so you don't have to hear too much of our voices for too long a time at any given time. Um, so the slide that's there on the screen is just sort of a bit of a brief um, path about um, what we're going to talk about today. So I might ask whoever's got control of the slides if maybe they could go to the next one. Um, and we're going to start about um, some changes that have been made to access. Um, so the first, uh, and, and I just want to, I guess, emphasize that in, from our perspective in terms of what's actually in the piece of legislation that just passed in Parliament, um, we think that there are um, limited changes to access at this point. So firstly, in terms of um, pe new people, new participants entering the scheme, so new participants will be informed whether they've been granted access mm -hmm. to the scheme and whether that um, has been on the basis of them either being accepted through the early intervention pathway or the permanent disability pathway. Um, and so I guess we we would uh, we would say that the NDIS has always intended to draw this distinction between the two pathways, um, but this distinction hasn't really played out in that way in the way that the um, the scheme has been run in the last um, in the last 10, 10 11 years. Um, we've heard a lot of concern about this, and I guess um, we just want to. We think it's important to say at this point that the, the the changes that are being made in the law don't establish any particular different treatment for early intervention participants as opposed to disability participants. Um, so simply at this point, that people will be informed whether they've been granted access through one pathway or the other. Um, we think that there'll be further legislation or policies in the future that might create different approaches for participants in those different pathways, but we haven't seen that yet, so we're not able to say what that difference might look like at this point. Um, in terms of a, another impact on the scheme access, so in um, looking at the changes that have just been made to the Act, um, there are, as uh, from our perspective, very limited changes to access, as I said at the start, um, and we don't expect people who would otherwise have been eligible for the NDIS to now be made ineligible by this legislation. Um, so while it's possible that there will be some further amendments to the parts of the Act that deal with access in future um, law or policy, we haven't seen this yet, and so we're not, we don't want to speculate about that. Back to you, Mitch. Oh, you're on mute, Mitch. Yep, yep. It was bound to happen eventually. Um, I can see that with the slides here, we've lumped in um, impairment notices under changes to NDIS access. I probably think that's that there. There's a link there, but really, they're probably slightly impairment notices don't relate directly to access. So now, impairment notices is a term that's in the new legislation, or I think notice of impairment. What that means is, at the moment, many of you will be aware that if a person has multiple different kinds of impairments and they say to the agency, these are my three impairments that I have and I would like to get access to the scheme, all the agency will say is you're either in the scheme or you're not. Um, now, that's a bit of a problem because it means you don't know on what basis the agency considers you've become a participant, and that can flow through into the way that you have debates with them about funding or the way in which perhaps even in the future, if your circumstances change, your engagement with the scheme might change. Um, so for a long time, the community has been saying it's really important that the agency tells you what impairments they accept have allowed you to meet the access criteria. That's really important. Um, the new legislation requires the government to do that. So from the 1st of January 2025, if you became a participant for the first time from then, you would get given with your um, notice, your, your sort of um, grant letter, um, you would also get given a notice of impairments that says, you're, you're in the scheme, and just so you know, the reason you're in the scheme is because we've accepted this impairment, this one, we haven't accepted this one. And that, that means it's more transparent for people. And so they'll tell you these, um, the impairments within these categories of um, whether it's intellectual, cognitive, neurological, sensory, physical, or impairments to which a psychosocial disability is attributable. Um, so... You'll get given that notice of impairment at that point. Um, and we, we think that eventually it's likely that everybody will get given, if you're a new participant or an existing participant, you will get given a notice of impairment so you know what the agency thinks and, and what's on their books. And if you don't agree with it, you'll also have the opportunity to say, well, actually, I think I like that you've accepted me into the scheme, but I don't like that you've only accepted me on the basis of this impairment and not this one. 
you can review the things in that notice of impairment. You can challenge that. And so that's a really important step, and we think that's a step in the right direction towards more transparency and more reviewability of this issue. Um, and, and we'll be talking a little bit more about, I guess, that multiple impairments question going forward. But just to say these impairment notices we actually see as, while we know not everyone has been totally happy with the language that's used around it by the legislation, we think that the feature that's there is actually a really positive one for participants that helps protect people's rights. Um, so then we just want maybe move away from access and onto planning. Um, and so starting first with some terminology in how plans will be referred to. Um, so when uh, a person goes through a needs assessment, which we're going to talk quite a lot more about shortly, and they get a budget, that will be then called a new framework plan that the participant will get. Um, eventually, all participants are going to be um, getting new framework plans, and that transition is expected to take five years. Um, that transition time of five years is um, is because there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, and until a participant gets a new framework plan, there's new terminology that's been introduced um, through this legislation, and that's now called an old framework plan. So old framework plan, existing plans, so plans that people have as of um, when the bill commences on the 3rd of October, will be called old framework plans. If a participant is due for a new plan in the next little while, and I'll say next little while could be, you know, at least 12 months, um, that will still be an old framework plan, um, even if they, you know, go through a plan review or a plan reassessment. The headline for now is that everybody on the NDIS will continue to receive old framework plans until they are told otherwise, and we'll expect people to be transitioned over in groups. Um, but if you're a participant and you haven't been told that you're transitioned over to that new framework plan, you'll continue to receive old framework plans, um, and the changes to your planning we think will be fairly minor. So just in terms of some of those changes, um, so the in terms of the uh, the legal framework and how people get assessed and funded for supports. Um, so the, the, the legal test in Section 34, which deals with things like value for money and effective and beneficial and um, those, those sorts of different um, aspects of the test. There's currently one aspect of that test, which is in 34.1F, which is the support is most appropriately provided by the NDIS. Um, so the change that's been made by this legislation is to get rid of that particular part of the test. So they, um, won't, the agency won't need to consider anymore whether it's most appropriately provided by the NDIS. And now what will be considered is whether the support is an NDIS support. And um, that's obviously, you know, uh, will be defined by these lists that we've been talking about for the last um, for the last few weeks. And those lists are yet to be finalised. We're going to be talking a lot about the list later in this session. Um, so in some ways, we, um, this this removing that old part of the 341F test, whether it's something was most appropriately provided by the NDIS, is an is an improvement um, for participants from our perspective. Um, and the reason we say that is because that particular, you know criteria was really quite difficult to apply and to understand and led to a lot of instances where the NDIS would say we're not funding it and other service systems and government also refusing to take responsibility for funding those kinds of supports. Um, so that's that's the only real change to the legal framework in old framework plans. Um, for plans that are reviewed after the 3rd of October and um, we're calling those old framework plans, as I mentioned. Those plans will now specify things like funding component amounts, um, which are basically the total funding for a group of supports. We think that this is likely to be quite similar to what happens now where supports are grouped under core supports, capacity building supports and capital supports and things like that. Um, the new plans from the 3rd of October will also specify total funding amounts, which again we don't think is, that, is should be that different from what um, people already see as the total amount that they've got in their plan. Um, what might be new is funding periods that are going to be introduced. Um, and those funding periods are, um, basically mean that the funding that a person receives might be released, might be released in stages over the length of their plan. Um, and the government says that the intention of, of introducing this concept of funding periods is to try and reduce instances where people are um, finding themselves spent, that their spending goes above their whole plan amount. 
Um, the NDIA said for all plans that are created after the 3rd of October, um, they will be for a duration of 12 months. In the future, when the transition happens to new framework plans, some plans might be for longer than 12 months, but we don't, just don't have that information yet. Um, now, you've heard us talk about there being quite limited changes to access and also relatively limited changes in the immediate term to old framework plans, but you might also have heard quite a bit about the ways in which planning will look different because of this new legislation. And that mostly, most of that discussion about a, a different planning process and structure relates to what are called new framework plans. And as Sheetal said, those are things that we're going to start seeing coming in uh, in about 12 months' time or so, this bill establishes a framework that will begin to come into effect in about 12 months or more, um, and those are called new framework plans. So at that point, people will begin being transitioned onto these new framework plans, and new framework plans have a different structure, a different process for how they're made, um, and the, uh, a, a variety of different sort of systems and, and, and pieces of law that will relate to them. So... For a new framework plan, uh, essentially what will happen is it will no longer be what's called line-by-line -line planning, where uh, the NDIA uh, decision-maker needs to decide, do you get this support, do you get this support, do you get this one? Instead, the planning process will revolve around first uh, a needs assessment to determine what is the, the general picture of disability need a person has, and then making that into a single budget. Um, or a, a budget containing a couple of components that can be used qu quite flexibly. So I'll take that bit by bit. First, the first thing that will happen if you have a new framework plan is a needs assessment. And a needs assessment will use what's called a needs assessment tool uh, to determine what is the picture of disability need that the participant has. So... We, we've heard quite a bit about needs assessments. Um, I know there's been a lot of concern over exactly what a needs assessment will look like, who will do it, what process they'll follow. Um, this is one of the points in today's webinar where we're going to have to say we don't know the exact answers to any of that just yet. What we know from the law and what we know from what government has said is that there will be a needs assessment. There will be a, a, a tool that is used to conduct that assessment. Um, but that those things will be uh, to be developed through a co-design process. And so we don't have a lot of detail until that co-design process happens. Um, the government's said, well, look, what they really don't want to do through this process, we've heard repeatedly from a lot of parts of government, they don't want this to turn out like the 2021 independent assessments proposal. And the big point of difference that they have been keen to stress is that they want to highlight this co-design process. Now, I want to be clear, we understand there's not always a guarantee that they're going to get that right. Um, Co-design doesn't always, um, you know, the, the disability community has made clear about there have been plenty of occasions where uh, governments have talked the talk but not walked the walk on co-design. But the, 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 the picture that is being painted of this is a process where these needs assessment details are worked out through a co-design process. The little bits of information we do have for how a needs assessment tool will work do sort of suggest that the government's thinking is they'll probably need to come up with multiple different kinds of tools for different experiences of disability, where you probably can't use the same needs assessment tool for somebody with, say, a physical disability to somebody with a psychosocial disability or somebody with a sensory disability. There needs to be a, a set of nuances to account for the different kinds of disability and disability experiences people might have. Um, now, the government seems to have, have in their minds to be intending that needs assessments will be done by professionals who are either NDIA staff or contracted by the NDIA. So we know they're not thinking of it being a person's own practitioners. Um, with that said, we don't know what skills and qualifications are going to be required for those needs assessors. That is supposed to be something that is, again, subject to co-design, saying, well, when somebody is going to do this needs assessment, what is the minimum level of of experience, of skill, of qualification they need to have to get it right. Um, one thing I do want to speak to in particular um, is that you might have seen some news headlines, et cetera, about people being made to pay for their own needs assessments. Um, our understanding is that kind of set of concerns largely came out of some pretty specific answers that 
um, a government minister gave during one round of Senate questioning. But we also understand government has subsequently said that they don't plan to make anyone pay for their own needs assessments. And that was a, a, a sort of a, um, a, an inopportune response that was given by that minister. So we, we don't understand that to be part of the thinking at this point. Um, now, acknowledging that, again, I've, I've given some details there, but there is a lot of things that aren't yet clear because of the, the need for those to be designed over the next 12 months. One thing I want to cover off in particular here is this question of um, whole of person, um, the, the way that multiple impairments that a person might have or multiple disabilities a person might have are going to be recognised and engaged with. I know this is something that's of a lot of concern. We saw it in the comments um, from the registrations. Now, the needs assessment is supposed to work at a, a whole of person level rather than just assessing individual disability needs and trying to attribute needs to one impairment or another. Um, so it's supposed to take into account a participant's support needs that arise from an impairment that the person met access to the scheme or could have met access to the NDIS for, but also to include where that impairment is impacted by another impairment that might or might not meet the criteria for access, including if the, the second impairment might compound or change or, you know, in other ways alter the need from the, the first impairment. So I, I've, I've given some language from the legislation there, but I'm gonna, I want to really try and unpack this a bit. Um, I know there's been a lot of different understandings of whole of person at different times and by different people um, and a spectrum of definitions that have been used. So at one extreme, one view that's been taken of this, um, and this is the view that the NDIS has sometimes, the NDIA has sometimes taken in the past, they've said, oh, well, only supports that come very directly from impairments that met the NDIS access criteria could be considered and funded. Only supports that come from really, with this really direct link to an impairment that meets the access criteria. Um, that's, that's, I guess, one extreme view. That's a view that I think has been open to a lot of challenge, a lot of debate. Um, I think has, has not generally been approved by the AAT in its decisions that have had to consider this. Um, but that is one end of the spectrum of these views. At the other extreme, um, or the other end of that spectrum, has been suggestions that, well, once you're in the NDIS, the NDIS should fund any need a person has from any impairment that you have, regardless of whether that impairment's major or minor, whether it could or couldn't meet the NDIS access criteria. Um, that's and that's sort of the kind of the 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 the, the most uh, open form of whole of person funding. So that is there's kind of a spectrum between those two positions, and we've seen a lot of variations on that being expressed in this discussion. Now I think it is probably fair to say that what this bill does is take a position that is between those two, um, but perhaps a little bit more towards the more generous, more open end. Um, it is less restrictive than the approach that the NDIA takes currently to funding um, and probably less restrictive than most of the uh, the tribunal decisions have been on this too. So what the, what the bill says is, again, there has to be some kind of link to an impairment that could meet the access criteria. You can't just say, well, it's, a, it's an impairment, it's a disability, or there's a disability I have that has a need that disability wouldn't meet the access criteria, but I should still get funded. That, that's not quite enough. You would need to say some, some disability that meets the access criteria is linked to this support need. But that link, the level of link that needs to exist is arising from. And arising from might seem like, well, maybe how direct does that need to be? Arising from is a very defined and technical legal term. It's used in areas like workers' compensation um, and kinds of negligence law. And Australian law has said that arising from is a very broad term. So um, the link between the access disability and the support need can be quite, quite uh, limited. Um, it doesn't have to be particularly direct. So to give you a couple of examples from cases on this, there was one case where a, uh, a guy who was at, at a work event got drunk at that work event, and on his way home, he fell out of a window and he hurt himself. The courts decided that in that case, his injuries from falling out that window were arising from his work because he'd been at a work event beforehand. There was another case where someone was cooking lunch on their stove during a lunch break, and the stove exploded and hurt them. The court also said that is 
that those injuries were arising from their work. So those are quite broad understandings of the link between the cause and the effect. And so for a, a support need to be arising from a disability that could meet the access criteria can be a relatively broad picture at law of that linkage. I'm aware that's quite quite a nuanced set of concepts. Um, so I hope I've done that justice and I'm aware that we may well get some questions about this at the end. Um, but essentially what I want to communicate here is um, this is something where a pretty broad picture of disability is being captured and somebody with multiple disabilities, um, nonetheless, all of the needs that relate in some of that broad picture to the disabilities that meet access should be able to be considered and covered in these new framework plans. Um, I want to note something we've heard suggested is that the needs assessment might note multiple impairments on this arising from basis, but then those impairments might get ignored again when it came to setting a budget later on. We're not sure where that idea has come from. Um, the law as it has passed in this bill says this arising from approach to hold a person should apply to both needs assessments and to budget setting. The NDIS as a whole should be taking this arising from approach to the link between disability and support need. Um, now, um, moving on from the, the whole of person piece there, um, as we've said, for a new framework plan, a person will undergo a needs assessment using a needs assessment tool. At the end of that, a participant will be given a copy of the needs assessment report that is prepared. And that means that you will have a chance to look at that report to give input and feedback before the CEO makes any, before the NDIA makes any planning decisions. And if you see that needs assessment report that's been done and you think it's wrong, um, you think that the needs assessor has made a mistake, they've misunderstood the, the circumstances, um, we, the, the law provides for uh, a replacement, you to request a replacement assessment. So you wouldn't uh, appeal the needs assessment so much as you would say, I think that's wrong and I'd like a replacement. I'd like another, another needs assessment. Um, basically saying, let's go back and have another go because the first one got it wrong. Now, it's not clear in what circumstances the NDIA will agree to a replacement assessment or not. We expect there will probably be some rules made about when you get a replacement assessment and when you don't. That is something that um, I'll say we think could be improved. Um, we're on the public record in our submissions saying that we thought the bill should have given some more guarantees about when a replacement assessment will be available. Um, instead, what's happened is that will be left up to rules to, do, to give some more definition to. And we haven't seen any plan for what those rules will contain, so we don't know exactly how this will work, but we would expect there to be future conversations over the next 12 months where people can give give input and the sector can engage with government saying, here are the times where a replacement assessment is really necessary. I also want to be clear that replacement needs assessments, whether you get a replacement needs assessment or not, is some, will be something that can also be considered through a review. So if you get a new plan and you challenge that plan at internal review or at external review at the AAT, the reviewer, the tribunal member, they will also be able to order a new replacement assessment. So the power to order a replacement assessment is something that will exist all throughout the process of reviewing a plan. Now, I hope I've covered that off relatively clearly. I'm, I'm conscious that there may well be questions at the back end, but I, I think for now it's probably best that we move on to talk about budgets, this other feature of new framework plans. And I'll throw it back to Sheetal because I've talked for long enough. Uh, I'll just uh, reflect um, something in the chat between of appealing your needs assessment, you said that you can maybe ask a replacement, you're not sure, under what conditions or all that, and appealing going to the AOT and all of that. Yeah, so I know a lot of the discussion has been about can you appeal a, a dodgy needs assessment. Um, I, I think it's worth saying that the appeal looks a little bit different than saying, well, let's have a specific argument about what did the needs assessor do and did they look at this thing and did they look at that thing. Um, instead, what happens is you appeal the plan and in the course of doing that, um, that appeal can consider, is the needs assessment dodgy and do we need a new one? So I would say there is still a way to, um, to challenge a needs assessment that gets it wrong. Um, although I'd like some more definition on that process. There is still a way to challenge it. Um, it just doesn't look like a, a, an argument about the content of the needs assessment so much as whether a new replacement one is needed instead.
said so to God, you should get another one, and it's exactly the same. I would be surprised if it came out exactly the same, I suppose, um, because if the first one, if it was, if everyone agreed that you needed a replacement one, it would probably be because there was something that ought to be done a little bit differently. Um, Could it be worse? I guess we don't know exactly what the tools will look like. I suppose it is possible it could be worse. And if you got a second one and it was worse, then there'd be perhaps another question of, well, do I need another replacement assessment? I mean, the vibe in the chat room is, if you're not being allowed doing these assessments, then who's looking over their shoulder and making sure that they're not, you know, trying to rip people off? I think this is probably a point where it becomes a really, really vital question to consider. What are the qualifications of the needs assessors? Where do they sit in the process? What are the tools they're using? And I acknowledge that's an area where I don't have a lot of detail to give, but that is a question that if that's subject to proper co-design, I would hope that the needs assessors themselves are being given the right skills and qualifications to do the job and the right le- and that might include the right levels of independence as to how they do it and the right levels of accountability. I would expect that those kinds of questions are things that could be fed into a proper co-design process. So I'm not suggesting that there is no reason for the disability community to say, hey, we want some answers to those questions and we want them to get answered appropriately. But I, I, I suppose I would say that a proper co-design process should encompass those things and I think it's worth putting the right kinds of, um, of pressure on, 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 on governmental decision makers to consider that kind of feedback. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to move on to budgets now and um, so Mitch has talked um, about needs assessment and how that process um, ultimately will hopefully correctly identify participants NDIS support needs. So then in terms of where to after the needs assessment, the the law talks about a method being applied to quantify a budget, and that budget will then be basically how much NDIS funding a participant receives. Um, so that budget will have uh, roughly two categories of funding in there, or for some people maybe it might just have one category. Um, so the category that will be there for everyone will be a, um, a category of flexible funding, which is where participants will basically have the choice and the control to identify and pay for the supports they need. Um, and the second category that some participants might have would um, funding for stated supports. And the um, the information that we have about that at this point is that that might be for participants who need high cost items. So funding that can only be used on those specific items. And the there will be NDIS rules that will yet to be made, um, setting out the types of stated supports. Um, but the indication that we've been given from government is that that will include high cost assistive technology, home modifications and supported independent living. Just returning back to what I said a moment ago about the method that's used to determine the budget. Um, so that method will be me- will be a document of sorts that will be made by the minister. And the government has said it will consult with the community in order to develop that method. So we're going to um, we're going to talk a little bit more later about consultation with the community and what the requirements are in the law for that. Um, but again, as um, as Mitch has already said, you know, the whole of person approach we understand is 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 going to apply as well to the budget amount that a person receives. So the whole of person will be um, applied in the way that someone's needs are determined and identified and assessed, and then also in terms of the budget amount that they receive. Um, in terms of how what what might a participant you know um, might be. Uh, doing once they've got their budget, so in terms of obtaining supports and um, buying supports and um, and getting supports. So there are laws um, sets out some requirements that in certain circumstances a, a participant might have to um, be mindful of. So uh, the requirements that might apply, whether that relates to flexible funding or funding for a stated support could include that the support is provided by a particular person or class of persons. Um, 
So that's one type of requirement. And a second type of requirement could be that a specified process is um, is undertaken before the supports are purchased or provided. So, for example, there might be a requirement that a participant obtains a certain number of quotes, say, for home modification. Um, a third requirement would be um, that there are conditions that need to be satisfied before the support is bought or provided. And then there's kind of a catch-all in the law which says that there might be a whole, like, you know, other requirements that are specified in rules, in the NDIS rules that are yet to be made. Um, one of, uh, it, it's a little bit hard for us to exactly know what those requirements are going to look like at this point, um, but the government has, um, one of the ways in which the government says that requirement, these kinds of requirements might be um, applicable is, um, for example, where um, to support early intervention pathways or also alternate commissioning in First Nations communities. So I think there'll be, we expect that there'll be future legislation and policy um, in order to build these, um, this, this particular part of the legislation. So at this point, it's a little bit um, bare in terms of what we know, but we um, expect that there'll be further work done so that participants know um, what kinds, more about what kinds of circumstances these requirements might be applied to them. We've also, you know, want to acknowledge that this is an area that we've heard concerns about, um, and um, we, and, and if the NDIA uses these powers unfairly or in a very broad way, that it could unfairly restrict people's choice and control. And so, um, I guess from our perspective, we would um, be looking to make sure that it, and um, to see that the NDIA is actually using these powers properly. And I think it's really important that the community also watches how the NDA is using these powers to make sure that they don't use this power in an inappropriate way. Another an, another way in which um, funding and spending funding might be restricted um, is in terms of um, so, so as I mentioned before, people have flexible funding and flexible funding can be spent on NDIS supports, as we've already mentioned. Um, in some circumstances, the NDIA may be able to put some additional restrictions on how someone spends that flexible funding. So the law sets out a couple of specific circumstances um, in which that kind of restriction might apply. So one circumstance is where the NDIA has come to this view that the participant might suffer physical, mental or financial harm. Um, and I also want to acknowledge at this point that um, our understanding of those words is not clear. The government hasn't been clear about how those words are supposed to be interpreted just at this point. Um, so that's all that we can really say in terms of that particular circumstance. A second circumstance in which the NDIA might be able to restrict how a person spends their flexible funding is where there might be a history of that participant not spending in accordance with their funding and their plan before. So um, that's definitely one. And again, we, you know, that's a very broad way that that's been written into the law. And we hope that the um, that the way that it's applied in practice isn't as broad as that. Um, but again, it's one that we would um, say that it's important to watch how the NDIA uses that power. And then the third thing that the law says about circumstances is that there could be other circumstances specified in rules that are yet to be made. So at this point, we only know those two circumstances and we know that there might be more circumstances listed in rules. Um, so what this means is that a participant will not be able to spend their flexible funding on anything um, that meets the definition of NDIS supports, but that they're if these um, if these kinds of restrictions are applied, that their spending will be restricted to specific kinds of NDIS supports. I'm just going to move on then to um, what happens if a budget is overspent. Um, so if a if if a participant has spent the funds that have been um, allocated in their budget, the NDIA can provide additional funding, but only if there are exceptional circumstances. And there are, these, these circumstances are listed in the legislation, so at least there's some clarity there. And these circumstances include, for example, where a participant has experienced fraud or financial exploitation um, or where um, additional funding is needed to protect a person from a threat to their life, health or safety, or where a person hasn't been able to request a variation or a reassessment. So I might just finish off this part by saying that um, from our perspective, the Section 48 um, process, which currently applies, will still apply to new framework plans as well.
Um, now, I I note that a couple of points here, again, um, you probably heard me say the word co-design quite a few times in this conversation. Um, and I know that there's a big a bunch of big pieces around that, um, that the, the government, the legislation have said will be subject to co-design or at the very least in some places consultation. Um, I, I think it's fair to say um, the disability community is pretty, pretty wary of having seen examples of failed or insufficient co-design by governments in the past where they don't actually follow through. Um, I want to really acknowledge that. Um, and also to acknowledge um, it's pretty hard to develop a law that requires a government to do co-design. Um, one reason for that is there's not one accepted legal definition of co-design, so it's a bit tricky to put that into legislation. Um, so there is, I, I think it is, a government has recognised, and I think I want to recognise as well, there are plenty of parts of this where government is asking for a certain amount of trust from the disability community that maybe doesn't feel earned. Um, one thing, though, that I do want to say that um, a lot of advocates and people working on this bill really fought for and, and that the law does now require is a particular form of what's called a consultation statement um, whenever one of these rules is made around things like the needs assessment tools and process or around the way that a budget is set and developed. Um, and that's actually something that's quite novel in the NDIS Act. It, it's more or less new in Australian law in general. Um, so um, what happens is when the minister makes those rules, he needs to table them in Parliament for 30 days before they become law. And that gives the Senate a chance, if they look at what the minister's put forward and think it's not very good, the Senate can actually uh, veto it. They can disallow it. Um, and so when the, so the minister puts forward this rule, when, when he makes a rule, he puts forward the rule and he also normally puts a statement with it saying, here's what the rule does and, um, you know, maybe here's who I've talked to about it, here's how I've engaged. Um, but historically those have been pretty limited and they don't really say very much a lot of the time. They don't give a lot of detail about consultations that have happened. They don't give a lot of transparency. Um, and so it's really hard then for senators or for the public to say, actually, hang on, government, you've made this rule, but minister, you didn't... You didn't talk to the community that the rule's about. You didn't engage on this. Um, what the law now requires is that when the minister is making an NDIS rule to define, again, to define how needs assessments work or define how a budget will be worked out, the minister needs to provide a consultation statement that says very specifically what consultation he did or she did, um, how that consultation went, who was consulted from the disability community and particularly did they talk to disability representative organisations? Did they talk to people with disability? Did they talk to groups like EAC, for instance? Um, and what everyone said. And so when the minister puts this forward, it will re be really obvious to the Senate and to the public if the minister didn't do his homework, if he didn't engage properly, if he didn't do co-design, he will have to say, I, 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 I sent out an email, but I didn't really co-design it. And that will then be something that they can be held accountable for by the Senate. The Senate can have a chance to disallow that rule and the public will have a chance to say, hold on, this isn't what we voted for, this isn't what we want. Mm -hmm. um, that is a major and positive step for accountability over the minister Why, here. Obvious. That's obvious. an important safeguard to ensure that the disability sector gets engaged in these important pieces. Um, now... I want to really acknowledge that's not the same as mandating co-design. Um, and it might seem like it's a very limited step, but given the way that Australian government operates, the way the constitutional structures we work with operate, the way that our lawmaking processes operate, this is actually quite a big shift. And we hope it leads to more accountable policy design processes around these features that are yet to be worked out. We're now going to move on to um, the NDIS supports topic, which um, I know a lot of people want to want to talk about. Um, so, just firstly, in terms of this def this phrase of NDIS supports um, and what it what it um, you know means broadly. So, these uh, this new definition of NDIS supports is really going to change how the NDIS will operate. Um, so, previously, any type of support that could be funded. Um, could be funded under the scheme as long as it met the reasonable and necessary criteria. Um, now what's expected to happen is that there'll be this more prescriptive list of what is in and out of the NDIS, um, and um, and that's going to, I guess, dictate how people can spend their funding. 
even before we get to the lists, um, the legislation itself has ruled out some particular supports in a in a late amendment that was proposed by the coalition and that was um, agreed to by the government. Um, basically, the law na- the law itself, the NDIS Act itself, now um, prohibits NDIS funding from being spent on drugs, alcohol, and sexual supports. And so, I guess what that means is that those things could never even be listed as an NDIS support in the rule that's that's yet to be made. The government is now needing to develop this list of NDIS supports that sets out what supports it will fund and what supports it won't fund. Um, In terms of where this definition of NDIS supports will um, apply, so firstly, it will apply in relation to access. Um, So a person will need to show that they'll need supports from the NDIS supports list for their lifetime. As we said at the start of of this session, we don't think that that will significantly change whether someone would or wouldn't be eligible for the NDIS, but it is one place where this NDIS supports definition is appearing. Um, A second place um, where it'll impact how the scheme operates is in relation to old framework plans and um, support and what I mentioned what I mentioned earlier in terms of um, Section 341F being removed from the legislation. So instead of having to assess whether the support is most appropriately funded by the NDIS, the consideration is now, is this support an NDIS support? So is it on this list? The third way um, that it will impact um, the way that the scheme operates is in new framework plans. So as um, as Mitch mentioned earlier, there's no, there won't be this consideration of the legal test anymore of reasonable and necessary supports. Um, budgets will only be calculated by reference to the NDIS supports a person needs. And then um, I guess the, the the sort of final way in which the impact is really seen is when participants are spending their plans, whether that's an old framework or a new framework plan, they can only spend NDIS funds on things that are NDIS supports. Um, a participant won't be able to spend NDIS funds on things that are not NDIS supports. And if they do, there could be some serious consequences that flow from that, for example, debts. And we're going to talk a little bit about debts um, towards the end of the session. Um, So the legislation says the NDIS supports list needs to establish what is in and isn't an NDIS support, but they don't require the list to take a particular format. Um, However, because participants are now going to get a single budget that they can spend flexibly, It's important the support lists are really clear about what is and isn't an NDIS support. Um, We don't want to get too um, sort of bogged down into the legal detail here because it's quite complex. But I guess from our perspective there and um, and what the government's also being um, well, what the government's been saying is that there are constitutional reasons for this, which is why um, why they need to take why they're saying that they need to take this really prescriptive approach rather than a principles based approach. And although we're not necessarily endorsing that approach, that's our understanding as to the government's logic of it. Um, now, in the longer term, these lists of what's an NDIS support and what isn't, those are supposed to be drawn up and agreed between the federal government and the states as rules. That's going to take time, though. And because the, these NDIS supports and the lists are really important to a number of parts of the, the scheme, there needs to be something in place straight away when this comes into effect on the 3rd of October. So that's why the law provided for the NDIA to make a transitional rule to define NDIS supports. And that transitional rule will be in place for probably a year at least as those more formal rules are drawn up between the states. Now, the the transitional rule is being worked on and those who have seen a list of supports circulating and a lot of concern about what is on them and not on them you're probably thinking of a draft rule of that, a draft version of that transitional rule that was released for comment back in August. That draft rule got a lot of strong feedback from the community, including from us, Sheetal and I, and our colleagues. Um, you can see our submission on our website, um, basically pointing out that there are a lot of concerns about the draft rule. Um, now, a lot of those related to specific items and people's particular circumstances, things that have been left off that should have been on there, things that were made unclear or were inappropriate. If I was going to try and summarise some of the broader structural problems with that draft list, they might be that, first of all, the, the structure of the draft rules were confusing. They were made in a way that was kind of inconsistent internally within the lists. 
Um, there were some things that were listed three times. There were other things that had a list of NDIS supports with carve-outs, things that are ruled out but with carve-outs from that that overlapped in ways. It was, it was really hard to read and interpret. That's a big problem. They were overly prescriptive. They tried to list off things that really missed out important stuff, like, for example, white goods getting ruled out when, for a lot of people, those are actually really essential. Um, or sometimes they mischaracterize things in ways that were offensive. Um, one particular example was calling menstrual products a lifestyle product, which I think everyone can recognize that's not a lifestyle choice. Um, and, and they were also too narrow in ways that sort of reflected things that, for example, the NDIA had lost AAT cases over, like gym memberships, um, in ways that sort of looked a bit ideological to some people or maybe even like score settling. Look, there was a lot of really strong criticism of those. I think there was something like 6,000 responses that the agency got to that um, that draft list, despite the fact that there was only quite a short consultation period. It's worth saying what we're hearing from a few sources is that the Department of Social Services, the NDIA, heard those criticisms. They kind of took seriously that they didn't get everything right with that, that draft list. And we know they're working to draw basically a fresh version of this transitional rule. Now... I'm pretty concerned about the timing here. We're not going to see that fresh rule with a lot of lead time ahead of it coming into effect on the 3rd of October. And that is obviously not good for, for participants who want certainty um, and who want to be able to prepare for whatever that rule means. It's not clear whether there's going to be a chance to react to and feed into that new draft rule when it's released because of those timeframes. We think that's an issue. We know the community is concerned about it. It's a really unfortunate feature of the timelines that have been adopted for implementing these reforms being frankly, a bit too tight to do some of these things properly. Um, it's also worth saying there is some lack of clarity about what happens if you've got something in your current plan, um, perhaps something that you've had to fight for at the AAT in particular, that you're worried might then actually get ruled out by those draft lists because if it's not on the supports list after the 3rd of October, you won't be able to spend funding on it regardless of whether it's written into your plan. Um, it remains to be seen if there'll be some feature of the, the, the new list, the new transitional rule that accounts for that, that includes some kind of a grandfathering provision. What I would say is if you've got something in your plan that you think is particularly likely to, to raise issues in that regard, um, particularly if it's something you've had to have a dispute at the AAT about, for example, I would suggest you think about getting legal advice on that and, and probably doing so ASAP before the 3rd of October. Um, particularly if you've gone to the tribunal about it, I'd be considering getting in touch with um, if there's an advocate or a lawyer that's helped you in the past or a community legal centre that, that can give you some advice about that. Um, just making sure that you're prepared for whatever the consequences there might be and any action you need to take ahead of the 3rd of October. Um, I'm just going to then move on to the substitution process, which is um, still part of the whole discussion on NDIS supports. And um, a real, and I, I understand one that's you know um, raising a lot of questions from the community. So basically, the substitution process broadly might allow a participant to get funding for a support that would otherwise be excluded in those dra in those lists of NDIS supports. Um, so that's what we're calling the substitution process, or that's what the legislation calls a substitution process in that it would, I guess, substitute um, a support that is otherwise excluded in the in the support lists. Um, this involves a participant applying to the NDIA to have that support considered a, a valid support for that particular participant. Um, for a substitution to be approved, there are a few steps that need to be followed. Um, and the slide sets out some of those steps, um, but I, I guess I'm just going to step I'm going to step through them, and not everything that I'm saying is on the slide as well. So, um, first of all, the support would need to be in one of those lists that um, that Mitch has just talked about, and um, so and then second, the NDIA must be satisfied that the support would be equally or more cost effective and that the support would be equally or more beneficial to the participant. So the participant would have to provide evidence to demonstrate that cost effectiveness and the benefits of that support that they're seeking to substitute. Third, any other conditions that are specified in NDIS rules that are to be made. So we don't know what other conditions there might be to go through this substitution process. And finally, even if all those conditions are met, the ones that I've just mentioned, the NDIA still has a discretion whether to approve a substitution. 
So if the NDIA did not agree to substitute a support, that decision is not reviewable. And that is something that is, you know, that we think is um, problematic, unfortunately, because this was something that came up quite late in the whole piece of the way that the legislation played out in Parliament. It wasn't something that there was much, if at all, um, advocacy on, really, and that's really unfortunate. Um, so the fact that it's not reviewable um, is something that is also key to keep in mind. I guess in, from our perspective, we think that this is um, in reality perhaps going to be a narrow pathway for a limited number of people. Um, it's only going to apply to certain supports that might be listed in particular ways in the NDIS support list, and it's only going to be available in cases where a person can establish all of the things that I've just mentioned. So um, I, I think we just wanted to, I guess, um, you know, make sure that people are aware that the substitution process okay, should cool. be assumed as an alternative to designing the NDIS support lists appropriately. And if the NDIS lists... No, we won't have that by then, unless we're looking at um, I think someone's maybe just off mute. Um, so if the lists are not appropriately drafted, um, and what we mean by that is, you know, they're not clear enough, they're not inclusive enough, they're not um, nuanced enough to take into account different kinds of circumstances and diversity, and as well as that they're not flexible enough... Um, I guess in our view, the substitution process isn't going to solve those bigger picture issues. I think we've covered off there most of the major pieces that relate to the, um, the, the way that plans will operate in the ordinary course of things. And I might try and speed us up a little bit here, um, just because I'm conscious that we're um, already into the, onto the home stretch of our time. Um, one thing we wanted to cover off is that there are some uh, new powers that this that, that the legislation gives to the agency to uh, request information from participants. There's three new powers that they can ask for information. Two of those powers relate to if the agency is considering whether somebody's uh, participant status should be revoked, um, as they can already do if they think you no longer um, meet the, um, the, the the requirements to be a participant. Um, if that's what, what they're doing, they can ask for certain documentation or, um, or evidence. Um, and similarly, there's a power that relates to if the NDIA is preparing your plan, they can ask you to, to provide certain information. Now, I, I think that uh, probably everyone on this call appreciates that it's pretty invasive to be subjected in, uh, to the NDIA asking you to go and do a medical assessment or something that you don't want to do. Um, that's why we and others push really hard for there to be proper safeguards around these kinds of information provision pieces. There are some safeguards in the bill, um, including, uh, for instance, uh, in relation to the revocation powers, the NDIA can only ask you to do a medical assessment or provide that kind of medical uh, report that comes out of an assessment if they can't get that information any other way and they really need it. There's a legal test that applies there that sort of means they can only use that as, as a sort of a last resort. Um, and there are also some um, some provisions that say, well, if someone doesn't comply with a request for information, um, the NDIA has to really consider certain factors before imposing consequences for that non-compliance, including um, things like if it's beyond your control because you couldn't see the, the 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 person that you needed to get hold of the evidence, um, you know, whether whether you had other reasons why it was really difficult for you to provide the evidence, um, and and so there are there are some safeguards around those powers. Although I would note that nonetheless it's still a thing to to monitor because overly broad use of those would be really invasive, and we um, really wouldn't want to see that happening as a policy outcome. Um, another new power for the NDIA is in relation to plan management. So um, we're aware that there are lots of questions in the community about plan management and how that might be changing. So participants will still be able to choose their plan management type, um, but for a participant who is self-managed or plan managed, there may be certain circumstances where the NDIA will have a new power to change the plan management type for all or some of the participants' budget. Um, so the legislation sets out two specific types of circumstances where this might happen. So the first might be where a participant, the NDIA determines that a participant would be likely to suffer physical, mental or financial harm. And as I mentioned earlier, when we were talking about the way in which the NDIA might restrict how a person spends their funding, we similarly don't know, like that's the same language that's been used. And we similarly don't know exactly how that, um, how those words will be interpreted. 
Um, the second kind of circumstance, again, is the same one that I mentioned earlier as well. So where a person might have um, not spent their funds in a plan in the way that it's intended to be spent, um, that might be another instance where the agency might, has a, might have a power to change the plan management type, even if that might be, I guess, against the participant's wishes. So, and then there's a third catch-all again, which is where there might be some other circumstances that are specified in rules that are yet to be made. The thing to note here is that this um, will only apply to new framework plans, um, so it won't apply to old framework plans. And so new framework plans, we're still a little bit away from that coming into play. Um, another change to the law which was introduced by the coalition and agreed to by the government in the final week that relates in the final week when the bill was in parliament and which also relates to plan management is for participants or plan nominees who have been convicted of a crime that is punishable by imprisonment for two years or more or the crime that someone was um, found guilty of involves fraud or dishonesty um, so in those in those scenarios, the participant also will not be able to manage their own funding or the plan nominee also will not be able to manage the plan funding. Um, it's, a really, it's really unfortunate that the government agreed to this amendment, which was, as I said, put forward by the coalition um, and disproportionately um, impacts certain groups of people. So, for example, First Peoples Disability Network um, said that First Nations people would be particularly impacted by this um, given their overrepresentation in the criminal justice system. Um, I might pull us forward from here into um, debts, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, there is a more substantial framework that this um, that the, the bill set out around debts, um, and there's been quite a bit of nuanced discussion about some of the potential legal loopholes or unintended consequences of the debt provisions. We're probably not in a position here to discuss a lot of those in heaps of detail. I just want to say a couple of key things. Um, one major, I guess, general takeaway is that there are some pieces in the new law that allow for closer oversight of how, how flexible funding is spent so that if it's spent on things that it shouldn't be um, or that rather the NDIA thinks that it shouldn't be that are outside of the, sort of the um, stipulations in the plan, um, it's possible for those to be raised as debts. Um, it's really important, again, that these support lists are drafted well and appropriately and that close attention is paid to them. Um, Secondly, there's been concerns we've heard about whether debts can be challenged, and we think those are pretty fair concerns to raise. Um, if the NDIA says that something is a debt against you because of the way that funding has been spent, um, there isn't a way in the law to challenge whether or not the debt exists. Instead, what the law says, oh, well, we, we, you have to accept there's a debt, but we can give certain circumstances where the debt can be waived. Obviously, in one sense, that's an alternative to challenging the debt because wait, if it, the debt gets waived, then you don't have to repay any funds. But it means that you still get seen as having incurred the debt, and there's really good reasons why people don't want to have that have to accept that if that's not correct, because the agency is going to make mistakes about these sort of things. It's inevitable that it's staffed by human beings who don't get it right 100% of the time, um, and perhaps less than a, a, a bit less than that. Um, that, that we think is an issue, that we think is something that's been ventilated through the, the lawmaking process and that we would have liked to have seen changed. Um, what we do know from the NDIA's public communications, the things that they've tried really hard to say pretty repeatedly through this whole process, is that they want debt raising and debt recovery stuff to be a, a last resort and they want those powers to only be used by the most sort of senior level staff who have really been thoughtful to it and are accountable to various processes for how they use that power. Whether that's enough to relieve concerns over these new spending and debt arrangements is something that remains to be seen, um, and, and I do think it's it's an area that is worth, again, closely monitoring to see what actually winds up happening in practice, um, because, as we say, there were some, some things that I think the, the community was reasonably asking for in that space that didn't wind up making it into the final law. Uh, and just uh, we also wanted to touch on some changes that were made about how people make claims for um, for supports. So the Act, before these changes went through, the Act didn't have a, um, it didn't contain in the Act itself, a, you know, a claims and payments framework. Um, and so a lot of the changes that have been made um, really reflects what is already happening, just that now it's explicitly set out in the NDIS Act. One of the new things, though, that comes with the changes is a requirement that a claim is made within two years of the support being provided to the participant. 
So two year time frame is um, something to really bear in mind. There may be exceptional circumstances when a claim can be made that is more than two years after the support was provided to the participant. Um, and so it's good to know that I guess there's that leeway there. Um, but the two years is is definitely a new requirement. Um, these changes, so the two year time frame um, will come into effect from the 3rd of October. There will be a transitional period of one year to allow people to make claims that are more than two years old. So I, that means participants, nominees, plan managers and providers will have the next 12 months to submit claims for payments of supports that are older than two years. But after that sort of one year transition period, claims will need to be made within two years unless there are exceptional circumstances. Um, now, I, I think we've covered as we've gone some questions around things like reviews and appeals, you know, um, I, and we're aware that's an area that a lot of a lot of questions have come in about. I do want to maybe summarise a couple of the things we've said on that, just because, again, I know it's it's sort of a, a big topic of what's reviewable and what's not. Um, so, as we've said previously, um, to kind of wrap up that sort of topic, um, impairment notices reviewable. Um, if you have a, a notice of impairment that says things that you think are wrong, you can have that reviewed. You can challenge that through the internal and external review processes. Um, review of a plan and a budget, that's the same as it is now. You can ask um, to, for a, a plan review or a reassessment um, through Section 48 processes or variations. Those will remain essentially the same as they are now. As far as the needs assessment piece, which is part of that planning process, um, that the, the way that that is challenged is through a replacement needs assessment, more detail on when and how those are available to come. Um, as far as plan management, that's another piece of just simply something that would be reviewed. Decisions about plan management would be reviewed as part of reviewing a plan. The substitution process, as we've said, that's not reviewable. Um, as we've said, we think that's a, that's a, a real query and a, a real issue with the potential application of the substitution issue. Um, things that are on the, um, the NDIS supports list or not on the NDIS supports list, that's not something that you can review on, a, on and of itself. That's a legislative document, uh, a piece of law, um, not something that can be reviewed by an individual. And in relation to debts, debts are not reviewable, but they can be waived. Um, again, that's a very, very quick lightning round summary of things that we've already said elsewhere on reviews and appeals, but we know that was a particular topic that people wanted covered off. Um, so I'm just going to go, we're going to talk about sort of what what's next or what we think is coming next. So we know that different parts of government are also working to communicate about these changes. Um, and it's um, a lot of a lot of information that needs to be disseminated to a lot of people. Um, and I think it's clear to us from the questions that were sent in the survey to this session that the information from government hasn't quite landed yet and people still have a lot of questions so we know we are aware that the NDIA are sending out emails, trying to get um, sessions on with providers, do some things on social media to put information out, um, and you know advertising on radio. Um, we're listening closely to what the agency is saying in those spaces, particularly because we're learning some of this new information at the same time as everyone else. So there is a lot of further policy design work that's still to be done by government and the community, and there are a lot of spaces in which disability organisations and the disability community will be asked to engage. So one of those areas which we've um, already touched on is about NDIS supports. As um, Mitch mentioned, the government is considering feedback from over 6,000 responses to the consultation that closed just a few weeks ago, um, and the government said it will be reporting back soon. There will need to be a fresh set of lists that are made available, and we really hope that that will include a chance for some feedback still, although, as Mitch mentioned, the timing on that is really tight with the lists needing to be released by the 3rd of October when the NDI, when these new changes come into, come into effect. I'll um, leave it to Mitch to sort of wrap up some of the other next processes. Yeah, look, I, um, I said at the top there would be a lot of points today where we would say, we don't know this answer yet. This is a process that's to come. This is still to be designed. So looking forward to some of those. Um, government says after um, after they put out some of this further information and, and reports on the sort of Section 10 lists, uh, there'll be consultations on total funding amounts, funding components and funding periods, rules on plan management. Um, 
We're expecting to see by the 8th of October, I think it is, the NDIA putting out a public statement about what its timeframes will be for engagement with the disability community and with states and territories on all of these rules and legislative instruments. So the 8th of October, we're expecting some more clarity about what are they asking about, what, are they, um, what, what processes are happening when for that future design and engagement. Um, the next year, I think probably the, the, the biggest pieces that I want to highlight um, is that there should be, over the next 12 months, co-design processes happening for the needs assessment tools and for the budget setting methods. We, I'll say again, we don't know what those co-design processes will look like. It will be really, really important for the disability community and its institutions to hold government accountable to make sure it does co-design properly on those things. Um, we also know that the, the, the third big piece, I think, that's going to be really important, and it's not something we've covered today, but is going to be around foundational supports and the way that those are designed. Um, immediately before this, there was a DSS webinar talking about the start of those consultation processes. We know a consultation paper has gone up on foundational supports where they're seeking uh, feedback. And I'll leave it to, to George and Nick to maybe convene another webinar on those if that's what you want to do. Um, I think, though, needs assessment, budget setting, and foundational supports are maybe the three biggest pieces. Let's put in here. All right, we'll have on the track. No worries. I think those are probably the three things that are most central to the participant experience, but there's quite a lot of other things we've talked about today where it's up for the government to design and, and, and hopefully, and to varying extent they've made commitments to doing so, to design with the disability community. Things like early intervention pathways, new NDIS rules about how certain events happen and, and in what way, the claims and payments frameworks, etc. We don't have the concrete timeframes on those yet, but we do know that we can expect the agency to be working on them. And we do think that there's a role for the disability community to really stick a foot in the door and insist that they be listened to on those subjects. We also know that there's more legislation to come. Um, this was called the Getting the NDIS Back on Track Bill number one. Um, and there are still a number of things from the NDIS review that, or from other places where government said they're going to do that would need to be enacted by parliament. So that probably suggests that we're going to see a bill number two and a number three, perhaps. Um, we'll be keeping an eye out for those. We don't know what will be in that future legislation. We don't want to speculate too much. It's probably most helpful to go looking at things like the NDIS review if you um, want to get some sense of where the thinking might be. Um, but I do want to say there will be further legislative processes on which lawyers like us parliamentarians, but also the community will have a say, and, and I think it's really important to do so. I think that's about the content that we had uh, set up to cover, and again, I hope we've tackled most of the questions that were thrown at us, but um, Nick and, and, and George, I'll, I'll throw back to you to <laughs> how you want to tackle any further any further content or questions. Thanks so much, Rich, um, and see how 